Mika, thank you for having me, <laughs> for having you. Wait. <laughs> thank you for being, being on the show. It is a great honor. And um, yeah, without further ado, maybe a few words about yourself and where we are right now. Okay, thank you, Gerhard. And, and first of all, like, thank you for having me on the, mm -hmm. on the show. It's, it's, it's really a, a pleasure. And um, <coughs> even though, well, maybe kind of word of kind of disclaimer first. So like, even though, um, well, because I'm, I'm Finnish, <laughs> I don't really show excitement, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't know how much I can milk that. I've been using that so many times. But yeah, so, so my name is Mika. And um, I don't know where to start, actually. I'm a human being, mm -hmm. enthusiast, big fish enthusiast. Wow. I do enjoy that. So like yeah. I, 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 I do enjoy eating liquorice. And, and maybe because I've been, I've been living now in Japan since October 21. And I used to mm -hmm. live in Japan before for like three years. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, licorice is really a tough sell. Oh, if really? Yeah. If you want to make enemies, you, you treat them with <laughs> licorice. I tried this in the classroom. There. Um, so, but yeah, that's, that's kind of digressing. Mm -hmm. But so I'm through and through, I'm, I'm an educator, researcher. So mm -hmm. I work in, in Rikyo University in Tokyo, Japan, College of Business to be more precise. And right now we are in cloudy Helsinki. I think I'm just looking outside the window. I think the clouds are actually breaking a bit. So not too bad. Not too bad. Not yeah. too bad. Mika, I forgot that you are licorice enthusiast. At this point, I got some amazing Danish licorice on the table. Mm, I I'll, saw that. I will get up now. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Don't, for, don't tempt. Don't tempt. And for one minute or 30 seconds, the show is all yours. The listeners, I'm just going to get up, get this Danish licorice. I forgot that Mika is a huge fan of them and they are delicious. And for 30 seconds, the show is all yours, Mika. All right. Thank you, Gerhard. So, um, yeah, this is a tough tough spot, especially when you're put on the spot. Um, so I would like you to kind of think about something nice that happened to you, something that someone else did to you, and, and show that to them if you can. Like sh share some words of appreciation oh, to wow. someone. So, for example, you know, now I would say, like, you know, I'm really happy for, for the upcoming or incoming <laughs> Liquid. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, thank you. That was amazing. I think um, my job is done here, and you can take over. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that's the that, that, that's the Austrian humor. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> Do you know them? The like Ritz by Bülow. Bülow. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I um I mean I knew them before, and I was. I showed them to my mom. So we walked by in Stock, uh, Stockman. Stockman is like this very, yeah, all you can get uh, shopping mall in the uh, center of Helsinki. And there's like this Lakritz by Bülow. And I was like, mom, have you ever tried them? Hmm. And I think we tried five or six different kind of uh, Lakritz and like four listeners out there. So I'm personally, I am, I, I can't eat Lakritz. And this is the only way I really enjoy them because they're coated in these delicious layers of here we have dark chocolate with uh, sea salt and passion fruit. And they're like all kinds of different tastes. Mm. Which one would you like to have? Dark chocolate with sea salt, passion fruit, or both? But you can clearly see that the yellow ones are on the top or in <laughs> at, the, at the bottom. So like, <laughs> would, would, are you inviting me to ask, like, can I have one of the yellow ones? Of on the course, bottom? yes. No, can I have whatever is on the top? No, you get the, you get the yellow one. No, I... No, because you need both. I know it because um, they're so different in contrast. And I'm going to also take both. Let's see. Ah, the texture also seems it's different. It's beautiful. So here we go. One yellow one, one dark chocolate. And we're going to try them together. Okay, which one? I would say the dark chocolate first. Okay. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Wow. Hmm. Mm. It's really nice, really succulent. 
exactly and I was like what I like it's like this the licorice licorice and the that's it's just so soft the how it dance together with the chocolate and the licorice itself yeah. it's not too aggressive the licorice because licorice liquid no liquid licorice <laughs> licorice because <laughs> I know there's licorice which is kind of like a bit more <laughs> aggressive on the taste side and I was like in the on this bitterness mm. Mm -hmm. mm. yeah that's true okay and now the second one another passion fruit yeah. cheers cheers <laughs> mm. it's really crunchy mm -hmm. mm. Mm. interesting wow so different mm. isn't it mm. Thank you, Gerhard. Wow, huh? Well, they are, it's really clever, actually. Like They're supposed to be eaten together, right? Yes. Right. And so the, you can't just have one. You have to have two at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. What a digression. Which is your favorite? Like, which one do you like? The passion fruit or dark chocolate with uh, sea salt? I would have to go with, like, as a one-off event, the passion fruit. Mm -hmm. But on a long-term enjoyment, maybe the... Uh, the dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. The passion fruit can easily get a bit like... It's very intense. Your, mm. It's very in your face. What about you? Uh, I'm on the same level. I think for the dark chocolate, it's a very smooth, you can eat every evening, basically. Passion mm. fruit once in a while. Yeah. Once in a while. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. Put your microphone a bit closer. Is it better? Yeah, this is much better. Okay. Well. But you can also like pull it closer to your mouth. You don't have to lean. Yes, that's amazing. It's actually good like this. Otherwise, I end, end up looking like a hunchback. <laughs> <laughs> like you know, when you when you type every day, or when you sit in the office, I mean, that's it. It's a, I know. So, Mika, um, thank you for the introduction, and um, I think we have known each other now for yeah, I think six, seven years, something like that. True. Sure. And uh, we met when I was at the University of Helsinki, and we got introduced to a common friend. And I remember um, what I admired and have been admiring since. Since I've met you, it's like this, yeah, there's this beautiful inner spirit of very progressive and playful and creative thinking and really trying to bring very fresh wind into higher education, how we see education as um, almost responsibility to society mm -hmm. and also like make this, make us more aware about this responsibility and even like double down on efforts to really take this more seriously by being more unserious. And one of your beautiful projects or creations in the last years is the Nordic Rebels, which is a movement and which also um, won a beautiful award, the Danish Award, Design Award. Oh. So, yeah, please tell me a bit more about Nordic Rebels, um, your work and what it is and why you started it. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So, like, that's that's already kind of raising the stakes <laughs> high enough. <laughs> and, I mean, to be precise or, like, to be transparent, um, for me, it's more like um, kind of guiding or it's an ideal, mm -hmm. like something that you are moving towards. Mm -hmm. So, like, just to be clear that, like, you know, even though I wish that all of my teaching engagements were like this, mm -hmm. that that's the kind of yeah, guiding star. Um, I fully get that, like, you know, we don't always have the energy. So, like, I feel, and those moments when I'm in the classroom and I feel that, you know, okay, it's not going so well or it didn't go so well. So I'm mm -hmm. painfully aware of those moments. So, like, just, just to kind of keep in mind that, you know, when we talk about um, transforming or changing mm -hmm. higher education, like, it's not always kind of successful mm -hmm that kind of uh, engagement, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just like an understanding and acknowledging that the kind of human fragility yeah. that kind of makes us, or it's, it's kind of, I think it's important to be kind of more forgiving mm -hmm. in that sense. But anyway, so like, <coughs> and this is a joint joint effort, right? So there's, there's many people involved and we have also like, in fairness, or to be clear, so we have also hijacked you, you've been also part of these <laughs> engagements, right? So like Nordic Rebels, what it is nowadays is 
part of also like because of your contributions. Mm -hmm. So that's something I think is worth acknowledging. But I think like originally, I think all of us so at the moment in the core team of Nordic Rebels, we have five people from different places, different walks of life, if you will. Um, but I think, so I, I can't really speak for everyone else. I think we all have our individual pathways, how we mm -hmm. ended up taking Nordic Rebels forward and having it, that as our identity or part of our identity, perhaps. But for me, I have this, uh, I used to say that I have a dark past. Mm -hmm. On um, So I did my first undergraduate degree in political science, international relations you know it was one of those kind of teenage dreams i don't know how many teenagers teenagers have this dream of becoming a diplomat um but that's what it is so like wow that's, so i that's why i started started studying political science and um i was a bit jaded so i read so i did my degrees like I've, all of my degrees are done in finland right? mm -hmm. and i was a bit kind of jaded after having read the, the entrance exam book, I think three, four times, uh, three or four times, like just through and th like kind of really digesting everything, kind wow. of road learning. Yeah, yeah. And in the entrance exam, they had questions of like how how does Max Weber define state or mm -hmm. how or define institution or you know all these things that you know I I just. The moment I stepped out from the entrance exam, the lecture hall, I forgot everything. <laughs> so like, you know, but then, I mean, I got in second try. And um, then that's the moment when I got really jaded um, because all the courses, they were just lectures and book exams. I mean, nowadays, like, I, I, I really see the value and like, you know, like, What's really important in Nordic Rebels is that, you know, we are not gonna, we don't want to downplay anything. I think lectures definitely play a role. Like, you know, imagine, you know, these, some people are really charismatic mm -hmm. when they give lectures, right? And those are like real pleasure to, to listen to. Yeah. But then there are so many other ways through which you can learn, right? So that was kind of one of my impetus in a way, or kind of guiding or reasons for wanting to rethink education. So like, why did I study? Why did I spend months and months trying to memorize a book? Mm -hmm. Like, how does that, how does that serve anyone? Like, what mm -hmm. does it measure, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm going to take a sip of this. Yes. Uh, is it chocolate or cacao? Yeah, it's 100% uh, Peruvian cacao. It's, yeah. Oh, it's so good. And the thing is like, when it cools down, it doesn't, the flavor doesn't go, mm -hmm. you know, when you drink coffee and it becomes stale. Yeah. Like, oh. But yeah, anyway, so, so for me, it was uh, like kind of this idea of how can we, can we do things better? And, you know, for me, it's always been, mm, how can I leave things in a better condition than what I received them, mm -hmm. whether it's a job or or yeah, maybe mostly kind of work related, and yeah. I don't I don't know where that comes from, but it's this kind of desire of desire to um, try to improve things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so like it's it's been super interesting. So that's kind of my personal side how I came to Nordic Rebels. Mm -hmm. Like how did I or why I thought we need to establish mm -hmm. Nordic Rebels, but then on a more um, I think the main reason why Nordic Rebels came about was when I was working for uh, for my home university or like Aalto University a couple of years ago and and we got some internal funding to transform courses and I was able to hire two people to work with me Teresa and, and Katarina hello <laughs> <laughs> and, and they they mentioned to me that there's a conference in, in Copenhagen in Denmark that they would like to go and get the inspiration for the course. And I was like, okay, sure, go ahead. And they partnered or they met people from, it used to be called Student House, but nowadays it's called Station. 
okay. student-driven mm-hmm. initiative. And um, so we partnered with them in 2017. And so basically what happened was that students from Copenhagen or Denmark joined our program or our course in, in Finland. And, and there was like, so the reason how Nordic Rebels came about is a bit of a kind of happenstance in a way. So because the, when, when you think about it, when you have a graduate program where students are enrolled in, and then you have other people coming in, they are not taking, they are only taking the course, but not the program. So mm-hmm. how do you kind of, how do you create a brand that feels inclusive for everyone? Mm-hmm. Because for them, for the Danish students, it was a bit like, ah, oh, okay, um, we are not part of the program. Right? right. So then one of our, we started kind of thinking about like what kind of name we could have for the course mm. or for the, mo- for the course. Because at that point, we didn't realize that, you know, it would be a movement or a company. Mm-hmm. And then Andreas also, hello. <laughs> He uh, he came up with the name Nordic Rebels. I think we had some other names as well, but uh, which is really not like interesting. So I, I think afterwards it was one of those classics that you know you come up with a name, you fall in love with it, then you stick with it, and then you realize that there's some kind of uh, I think was there like a biker gang or somehow like an actual rebellion. <laughs> called Nordic Rebels. Oh, really? Like, yeah. <laughs> so, like, like, so we are not part of that. Like we, are not yeah. like we are not like a militant. We are not the paramilitant <laughs> organization. We just want to goosebumpify higher education. education. Yeah. And sorry, I fully realized that that was such a long winding rant almost. So I'll stop here for a No, moment. it's amazing. Um, I think it's... Um, Let's maybe like uh, you just mentioned one of the values of uh, Nordic rebels, and maybe to just um, put it very practical or or clarify, like you know, like what what does because one of the values you mentioned was goose bumpifying higher education. Mm-hmm. It's very wow. It's very like you, you you listen to this and it's like wow. What does it mean in in your what you would like to achieve if a student takes a course or go through a university degree? Why do you think there's no well, like it may almost it almost cries for this? Yeah, we all know there's actually why isn't higher education goose bumpifying? Mm, mm. And how can we achieve it? How are you trying to achieve this? Oh, that's a good point. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Mom, um, significant. Um, yeah, I mean, this has been, in a way, like, how do you change something that you are part of yourself? Mm-hmm. So just to kind of give a bit of background, so like, you know, when we talk about goosebumpifying, for example, does it mean that other courses are not goosebumpifying? Mm-hmm. This is, I mean, we can also venture into this um, if you think it's relevant, but like what we found at some point that um, people, or maybe this is just like my understanding or interpretation of things, but people started to become a bit defensive in a way mm-hmm. because they felt that, okay, they are doing something that resonates with people and I feel this is a threat to me. Mm. So that was a bit of kind of challenge, like, you know, how much can you push the envelope and how much can you kind of push um, without... Um, what's the right word? Without angering people or without making feel people feel threatened, mm-hmm. I think that was like one of the kind of major learning points. So again, like something to kind of as a background mm-hmm. story. But goosebumpifying for us means basically when you see, and again as being as a like, so as a non-native speaker of English, some of the words might feel a bit off. <laughs> but do do ask like you know if if. Um, but like, so what, what I try, what I'm trying to say is that like, what really drives me and I think many of my colleagues is this um, seeing the fire in students' eyes. Mm-hmm. I was about to say like crazy look, but mm-hmm. that's a bit kind of le- that's a loaded word, and and the point is not to kind of yeah, that's 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 not a respectful word. So apologies for that. So like fire. So mm-hmm. we want to see f- fire in students' eyes. 
And basically, in more theoretical terms, that means you know people have ag- agency. Mm-hmm. So they feel that you know I can I can be in control of my life, and I can also do it um, so that you know I respect the life of others mm-hmm. around me, kind of living yeah. living things. So in a way, and like goosebumpifying, I have no idea where that came from, but you know it's the basic basically the the idea is that you know it's not the kind of goosebumps you get when you watch horror movies and you get freaked out, unless you like that. But it's more like, you know, this excitement when you have butterflies in your stomach or stomach or when you when you meet someone for the first time or, you know, you are anticipating meeting mm-hmm. someone for the second or nth time. Mm-hmm. So it's this kind of excitement that we want to kind of highlight. And and that's one of the reasons why we came up with this kind of... So we have five values nowadays. Um, planet-centric, transdisciplinary, safe space, um, empowering, and then goosebumpifying. Wow. And I really like... This is what one of the... Uh, so one of my political history professors mm-hmm. when I was studying political science... Um, so nowadays I'm a huge fan of like what I studied in the past. But like these come in kind of small bits, right? That you start understanding like, hey, something really nice happened to me. So like in the past. So how do we take those into our present action? Mm-hmm. So there was this one professor who was saying that when he's teaching, he, he thought that it's fair that the students know where does he come from? What is his kind of political stance? Mm-hmm. Where especially when you're talking about politics and political history. So we have the same thing that, you know, like, and this, re- this is really kind of what excites me that, you know, when we are in the classroom, we are not there only with our mind, but with our body, mm-hmm. like the whole person we wow. are there. Yeah. And we should be clear to the students that these are the values that we try to adhere to, because that also makes us, it holds us accountable. So, for example, when we say that, okay, we want the course to be a safe space, if we don't do that, students can call us out. Mm-hmm. That, hey, this is what you are doing. Can we discuss this? And, yeah, again, wow, digressing. No. But oh, it's beautiful because like, I think it's a very powerful statement. Also, just like, just like the notion that we have to actively think about it to trigger fire in students' eyes and Mm. heart makes me question how did we end up in situations that we don't have this by default that's what i'm wondering as well like you know i think you've read as well you know like paulo freire Mm -hmm. bell hooks john dewey and these are like decades if not even hundred years ago what they wrote so like you know those are people that you know or how do you call them? Scholars, perhaps, that we draw upon. But like we had so many of these thoughts already hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Same with transdisciplinary education, uh, sixty years ago. Where did what what mm-hmm. went so wrong? Yeah. Where, where did we wh- what happened? Yeah. And then also like I mean, like it continues then I think the test and I think very interesting. So we read about all that. Mm. And I think there's an eagerness. We all when we read these concepts that, you know, like to change education in all kinds of ways. And I think it's always like a very difficult um, or challenging term to say in change education because it's such a sy- systematic problem. Mm. And as mm. you can always, f- what you can do actually in the end of the day, just focus on one tiny part that you can have yep. impact on. Yep. Because a system is a very difficult and very cultural dependent. But th- the point is, okay, now you, you're aware of it. and also takes courage. Like when I l- think about you, to actually move the needle and how have you experienced kind of like bringing trying to change these kind of things to also like bring more play and unseriousness in your job and in your classroom mm. how was your experience as a person who tries to drive change mm. well one one thing that i noticed and again like this might be kind of <coughs> my interpretation of things Mm -hmm. but i got the feeling that and i guess this this applies to many organizations or many endeavors Mm -hmm. Um, as long as you are doing something that gives results everything is fine but i started wondering at some point what if what if i fail Mm -hmm. like how how how, like would 
would I still have the support? Mm. And I don't know. And, you know, that's something that, you know, would I would like nowadays I would love to kind of discuss or be more transparent, right? But um, I think for us, like in Nordic Rebels, and also for me personally, I think it's kind of trying to find a balance between um, kind of existing ways of doing and then throwing in some new things Mm -hmm. and always kind of balancing. Like I read this really interesting piece from uh, Hargadon and Douglas uh, 2001 where they talk about innovations like balancing between traditions and novelty. So they were looking at Edison's light bulb and how, how that, how light bulb was actually able to win was it from gas, gas-based lights? Mm-hmm. Because they were tapping into like existing infrastructures. Mm, yeah. So it was something new, but still familiar. And what I was a bit kind of curious, like how do you find the balance? Because at least my understanding or my reading of that's the, the article was like, there's no, I mean, it's difficult to say, right? So like, you know, how do you find the balance? Yeah. Because it's always contextual. Absolutely. So like, so what we tried, you know, we took inspiration from other educational activities. So, for example, I was really inspired by this Netflix language, which okay. is kind of intentionally, it's also kind of discussion point, right? So when we have, so we have now like three seasons of videos and podcasts, and they are called exactly like season one, season mm-hmm. two episode, like season one, episode three, yeah. to kind of simulate the kind of familiarity. But then, then there's the downside that if you become too familiar with the audience mm-hmm. or the participants' context, does it does it lose its uh, value? Does it become like something you end up hating, perhaps? Mm-hmm. So that's something that you know you always have to kind of strike a balance. Wow. Um, but yeah, so the episodes—that's one thing. And the episodes is like—is mm. it like um, Nordic Rebels on podcast, or like how you call? Or what what is the episodes exactly? We have, well, uh, I think they are supposed to be, or like how we we are using them yeah. in courses. In courses, yeah. okay. Yeah, so like instead of like sometimes, ah. yeah, so like sometimes it makes more sense to watch a video or listen to a podcast yeah. than read an, read an article, wow. for example. Wow, so you have actually, you have your own Nordic Rebels based kind of like content, which you, okay, you can give, students can listen to instead of, you know, going to a lecture or reading an article. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Wow. Yeah. So basically when we have face-to-face sessions, that's when we engage with the mm-hmm. readings or the episodes or the, yeah. So like we don't, we come kind of prepared. Mm-hmm. I think some people call it kind of flipped classroom that we engage in more conversation in the classroom based on the materials. Mm. But it's also like, you know, I, I was really happy because when we started creating those, the first season, um, one of the students came to me that, uh, and said that, you know, he was listening to one of the podcasts while he was cleaning. <laughs> and for us, I mean, that was like, yeah, okay. That I think we kind of intuitively maybe kind of subconsciously we thought that this would be the idea. Like how do we breach or how do we blend the boundary between school and rest of the life? Wow. That was quite nice, yeah. And I think that's a good keyword. I think this is also one probably key one of the key kind of like goals to blend this imaginary notion of classroom and real life Mm. because learning happens all the time and is not bound to a place how how do you see this like this breaking the boundary why why do you why ever why do you think it's important and what have you tried and how have students kind of like reacted to kind of like breaking these boundaries between classroom and real life? Mm. Hmm. That's one of those kind of million dollar questions. <laughs> like I, I wish, you know, what people say, for example, face to face or what mm-hmm. they say in the course evaluation form, there's so much kind of happening in between, like so much is kind of left, yeah. un- left unsaid. Um, but I, I think like one thing I noticed is that, you know, there's this, um, people often talk about the course being meaningful. Um, I'm not patting ourselves on the back here, but like what I'm trying to say is that, <coughs> excuse me, 
So people feel that you know there's a kind of personal commitment to the course, and they can explore themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the key things because we we try to see, or like, and this is also something we are explicit about, right? That learning takes place on individual, team, and cohort level. Cohort level. Yeah. Okay. So you are. You are, in a way, we are trying to instill people with this idea of <coughs> you being responsible for not only your own learning, but also those around you. Wow. That, you know, education is not only like a commodity that, you know, has like a price tag, mm -hmm. but it's also going to, it can be so much more if you want to, if you want to kind of take it that way. Wow. So we want yeah. to kind of, you know, give people more food for thought or inspire them with more content or experiences if they want to go that way and if they don't that's also completely mm -hmm. fine so like we try to kind of respect all these different ways but like not not leaving or not staying on this kind of transactional level where yeah. people show up in the course or in the classes and in the end they get a grade so like we kind of we want to kind of go beyond mm -hmm. beyond that such a beautiful saying that actually learning is not just about you and your learning, but also like your peers' mm -hmm. learning success. This reminded me of uh, my time at the coding school Hive, School 42. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And for the first time, I think I've realized, wow, what, what, what really mean, what, what is peer-to-peer -peer learning? Mm. And uh, I remember it was this beautiful, you know, like it's, you really have to experience this where you, yeah, you learn, you learn coding, but also like you always know that there's someone who knows more and someone who knows less than you. Mm. And actually by you teaching other people who are maybe struggle a bit, you actually reinforce your own learning, but also you pass on knowledge and make sure that the other person um, moves with you forward. Mm. Because in, in this peer-to-peer -peer learning concept, it only works when everyone, when actually the whole group moves together. Mm. So you actually have to really look after each other. And then you learn wow. from other people who know more than you. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it was a beautiful uh, self-organizing uh, learning experience. That's really powerful. Yeah. Like how did it, if, if you don't mind me mm -hmm. asking, like how long did it take for people to kind of assume this kind of being in the world? Yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, this was not something that they were used to before. No. So that's an assumption. I don't. Yeah. It's, it's very, it's, it's actually very fascinating because none of us it's new this concept at all and i was very many were skeptical if it works mm. and to get into school you have to there's like this four weeks intense boot camp and because it's so you just jump into this cold water and there's no teachers they're just like you, you i remember this you get into the school you get this card nothing is said to you just like there's your imac there's a station start that's oh, it wow. and then because no one tells you anything and we know, oh, okay, we don't know. It's kind of like reinforces that we have to find out the answers. Mm. And it's just, it happened actually from day one. Wow. That's really fascinating. I think, I mean, at least like kind of thinking about mm -hmm. that, I think there's so much like what education nowadays is. I mean, usually people have, like students have student numbers, yeah. right? Which in itself is already like, I see this from an administration point of view that you know yeah. we need to have those. Mm -hmm. But the prevalence of such identifiers, and like nowadays, I mean, I also have an employee number, so we are all numbers in the machine. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> it, it like it, how, how, how much more can you highlight mm -hmm. the kind of mass market, industrialized, compartmentalized, mm -hmm type of educational like you know how much we actually kind of perform based on this kind of frame mm -hmm. that is given to us or imposed to us and then when when we have that we don't really helping others or learning from others is not really it's not the kind of starting point no it's a sign of weakness yeah wow uh, yeah because you just uh, go there as this big ins institution you get a number and you don't even have a feeling that you're part of something Together, something mm. bigger. You have a feeling of, oh, we are, yeah, we are, we are kind of community that it's in it there for together. Yeah. And actually, um, this brings me like question, like because you have been now 
you worked in Finland in the UAE mm. and now you work in Japan. Um, how, I think it's so fascinating, I always like to, to think about like living and working in different cultures. And I think that's maybe focus on Japan. What, in your opinion, have, have been the biggest differences or the revelations between working in Japan in higher education and, for example, working in Europe and Finland? Mm. A difference is... Mm -hmm. um, one thing I was... I mean, yeah, there, there are so many fascinating points. Yeah. But I think, like, one thing I was... Both in the case of uh, the UAE and, and Japan, I was brutally surprised how open people are actually to this kind of not so serious performances. Oh, really? So, you know, like, for, for example, you know, I, I like to wear this uh, unicorn costume, yeah. or unicorn onesie or kigurumi in, in Japanese. <laughs> or I used to have this uh, Doraemon, which is an anime manga okay. character. I, I used to wear that first, but then, then it switched to, uh, to unicorn. And I was so surprised that, you know, like in both case, cases, like in the UAE and in Japan, my kind of superior or what's the kind of boss? Boss, yeah. Um, they, they explicitly asked me, so when are you going to wear the costume? And even like, you know, right now, like quite recently we had um, our graduate program graduation ceremony a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. um, congratulations all. It might be. Like my boss, like he was asking, like, so he, he looked at me like with his really kind of stoic face and he was like, why didn't you wear your unicorn costume <laughs> in the ceremony? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so that, that was like one surprising thing. And that kind of, you know, because when I, I've been exposed when I was in Finland, I've been exposed to this kind of really monolithic take on um, Middle East or Japan. I mean, mm -hmm. especially Japan, you know, everyone is like, you know, ninja, geisha, like all these kind of stereotypes. Yeah. Like everyone looks the same. Um, and, you know, we have been discussing this, like, um, you know, like here, you know, from your point of view as well, like your experiences in Japan, it's, it's not really, there's so much more. Mm -hmm. It's kind of really this exoticizing almost, marginalizing the kind of what is understood as Japan. So like mm -hmm. for me, it's like, you know, I'm also kind of trying to kind of consciously show people that this is what you see is only like a fraction of yeah. Japan, right? So like for me, that has been a really like one of the positive surprises that um, I have a lot of leeway to kind of explore who do I want to be in the classroom. Wow. In Japan. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And how do I kind of manifest that then? Um, and for what purposes? And like, so I, it's not like, you know, I'm not being put into this kind of foreigner um, role yeah. that, you know, you have to teach this and this and this and, you know, but it's more like, okay, let's see, who do you want? Like, who, who are you? Like, you know, like, mm -hmm. how can we support you explore that? So yeah. That, so that has been a huge, huge uh, difference. That's so fascinating because like, I think, um, yeah, when I was in Japan, what I've noticed, and I think it's so beautiful, like, because I, I thought about it, like, I really, I reflected on this because you, you travel through Japan and there's so much more self-expression in a playful way mm -hmm. you know with costumes and also like sounds and how people talk yeah and there's almost like a play and first you would think like Japan it's a bit more rigid or there's more hierarchy and like there's more constraints but then you would think about the flip side Finland or Austria is a very open country, so would you say? Mm. Mm. But you would see much less this almost um, unserious play happening with people dressing up and I was like performing yeah. a bit. How 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 would you ex or what are your thoughts on that? Like, why is this happening? <laughs> why <laughs> why is this happening? Yeah. Why 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 why? I d I mean, <coughs> maybe at least okay. Let's. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a kind of way to start, I need to adjust myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, like this is something I've been talking with, with my colleague um, in, in Japan. 
that because Japan has like a, a strong discourse mm-hmm. revolving around hom- homogen- homogenous society. Mm-hmm. That, you know, Japan is like so homo- uh, homogenous, mm-hmm. which is not really true. But I mean, that's another story. Um, but because it's really prevalent, and I think it's often used for kind of advancing a certain kind of like uh, political gains in a way. Mm-hmm. So it's easier to kind of govern a country that is seen unified, right? Um, so then coming as an outsider, I mean, I stand out. Mm-hmm. Like, how do I look? How do I behave? So I think there's like, in that sense, I'm really privileged um, that I have the leeway to actually do something different and kind of challenge o- constructively and meaningfully, hopefully, mm-hmm. provide some additional viewpoints to kind of people who are living in the country or like kind of as citizens, right? So there's the kind of interesting tension that, you know, there's, it's kind of accepted mm-hmm. that when you come as an outsider, you can, and to some extent, you should provide these viewpoints. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. And now I don't know how it is in Austria, mm-hmm. like what's your experience with Finland? Um, I think the problem is like, at least in Finland, I think people are like too serious in many ways. Okay. Which means that, you know, there are some topics that you can kind of discuss, but then there's always like, you know, at some point, um, I don't know, I think this is ch- this has been changing a lot. I mm-hmm. think the younger generations are like way more open, but there is still like this kind of really, or maybe it's also kind of partly academia, partly finish, finishedness that kind of creates this certain way of being. Mm-hmm. And if you deviate mm-hmm. from that, um, because I mean, let's face it. I mean, Finland also has like kind of, I mean, it's become more diverse, mm-hmm. but still there is like this kind of strong, um, kind of majority that kind of makes it difficult to stand, uh, not stand out, but I don't know, be different sounds like such a cliche, mm-hmm. but yeah. No, I know what you mean. I put up because like one thing, one image has just popped in my mind. I remember, uh, was it? I think the last some sometime last five years. But you see it actually more often. The it was the CEO of Nintendo, mm. and he did like this live, very <laughs> important live announcement, dressed up as one of the one of a Nintendo character. <laughs> 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 wow, <laughs> nice! <laughs> I gave Mika full permission to press any button at any time, <laughs> sparingly, sparingly, <laughs> and um, and I think. Now we're coming a beautiful topic. So it's like this. This no, I think I've never seen in the in Europe, but also like in U.S. companies, people like you know at this top level, to be able to express you know like to wear a costume like you did a unicorn costume mm. for at uh, in higher education, and for them it's very yeah, quite normal. <laughs> it's like yeah. this playful yeah. attitude to life, and I think I asked you before the show. I think it's very important to. What is missing, like instead of like, um, yeah, there's a lot of seriousness we often encounter, mm. and an antidote is to rediscover our playfulness within us. And I think there's a danger when we think about play and playfulness that we think about just games. Mm. How would you kind of like lay it out for people listening? Like, what is a playful attitude, and why is it important that we kind of like nur- nourish it again? Mm. I think one. I don't know if you agree with me mm-hmm. with me on this, but like play or play as an activity or playful playfulness as a mindset. Um, I think there are ways to interrogate what is considered as kind of serious, mm-hmm. and I think that's so. For example, um, well, through like games, I mean, games are a perf- perfect medium mm-hmm. for exploring and interrogating this. But there is this one example. Uh, papers please mm-hmm. yeah which tells the story of a fictitious country like an employee in a country wait employee what was the position customs no security Custom, yeah, secu- yeah security control on the border mm-hmm. and that's like you play that role and that's, uh, as you progress you have to, so basically it's really crude graphics mm-hmm. and what you see is people coming with different 
travel documents and you have to kind of see if they are legal or not. And then based on that, you get salary, which you need to kind of utilize to pay rent, utilities, give food for your family. Mm -hmm. And as you progress more and more in the game, your salary goes down. Wow. So you don't have enough money. You mm -hmm. have to make those tough, tough decisions, right? So I think for me, like you know, this is a, this is an interesting example of play interrogating mm -hmm. the kind of seriousness or like the other side, like other aspects of world. Um, but I mean, of course, again, like you know, what, as you mentioned, like this is a bit like if we only utilize games, then that's kind of missing the point. Or playfulness is much more. And I think for me, like this kind of interrogating what we take for granted in the classroom or what we feel um, or what we approach with certain level of seriousness. Mm -hmm. So then there's also like, you know, like, do we need to have this serious, serious attitude mm -hmm. all the time? And that's one of the things in a way, like me dressing up as a, as a unicorn. One of the reasons, like, it's not a conscious effort, like deep down, like, you know, it's it feels good. And yeah. that's like one of the essence of yeah. kind of play and playfulness that you know you engage in the activity for its own sake. But there is also like this when you start thinking about it that you know it challenges our notions of power mm -hmm. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So we are not trying to get rid of those, but kind of exposing and like you know how do we what happens when we take away from the teacher from the pedestal mm -hmm. and we flip it that, you know, the teacher is at the bottom of the pyramid, mm -hmm. for example. Wow. How does it change the dynamics in the yeah. classroom? Yeah. So it's really about enjoying the moment. And this is a huge cliche, right? But mm -hmm. like being in the moment and I trying out those different experiments to see how they can influence what yeah. happens in the classroom, for example. Wow. I mean, like, um, so it's so fascinating because actually if you think about it, even or like <laughs> you can correct me on this but uh, you know like even like a serious if you if you say like you know university high education even the setting itself or any kind of setting like a university hmm. and we say oh it's you know very serious actually we want to realize actually even like this setting it's also like a made up institution like we make up things this is university this is how we behave these are the norms and the hmm. rules in a sense, it's a very boring game. <laughs> it's a very serious game. Mm. And the question is then, you know, what you actually ex explain is actually now we can challenge, like, why do, why do we treat it so serious? Because it's also quite exhausting to play this very serious game. Yeah, It almost yeah. feels like unnatural. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. I mean, come on, like, who, I mean, who actually enjoys for example, introducing themselves in the third person. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> yes. Gerhard is a host of an award-winning podcast <laughs> series. <laughs> On his spare time, he enjoys licorice, preferably first with passion fruit <laughs> and then dark chocolate. <laughs> Gerhard has presented his podcast in this and this venue. And like, yeah. you know, come on, seriously. Who can, I mean, I, I feel like every time I have to write my bio <laughs> for articles in this third person format like some part of me dies inside <laughs> <laughs> so i really feel like just like i'm actually now that i think about it like you know why do i do it yeah like there's no point like you know like the, i mean the, the article for example has been accepted already mm -hmm. i could write whatever yeah absolutely but it's like so kind of it, it really permits i mean linkedin profiles mm -hmm. bios even like the visual portrayal, you know, you have those, when you look at people like the faculty on, on websites, I mean, we, we like to dress up and like, you know, and there's nothing wrong. Like, you know, I, I love suits. Yeah. Um, but I mean, does it have to be, is that the only thing? We can, we can do. And I think what was remarkable when um, you might remember this <laughs> ridiculous uh, card game, Loop of the Space Adventure. Mm -hmm. So one notion was exactly this, and was fast. I didn't know that it was it would work, but um, you can see in people's eyes when they have the permission to be ridiculous or they have the permission to be unserious. Mm. It's almost as if this huge, yeah, baggage would be released, and they can just be. That's so true. 
And I do remember, like, you know, when there was one session that we hosted in Aalto, and there were, like, people, no, students, company part, company representatives. Yeah. I remember, like, really vividly this one session where this um, company representative <laughs> with a suit, dark, yeah. ra- dark gray <laughs> suit, and after, like, half an hour, the person was so into it. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, 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 you know, here goes, like, you know, these are the living quarters, here we go, here we grow mice, <laughs> and, like, you know, no, you know, here's, like, a cannon, like, you know, pew, 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 pew. <laughs> that was, <laughs> I was, like, what did you do, like, that, that, that's, to create something like that is such a, like, wonderful thing, right? And I think this comes to, we talked about this, like, you know, uh, this feeling of authenticity. Mm. It's, um, I think I told you this story about it was like this, in this flow coaching program, I met this one person, she also quit her job and she told me like it was so exhausting in her job because she, every day she had to show up with this mask on her face Mm -hmm. and it's heavy to do this over years and years and years because it takes so much energy to almost play this because it's not a form of play. A A form of play where you're not allowed to show failures, you're not allowed to express beautiful emotions yeah. how do you how do you see how do you see this like how do you try how do you see this in your work and your your also like the connection between your playfulness as a very personal characteristic and your work life uh, i wish like recently i've become more how do you say uh, more aware of mm-hmm. my kind of my not having enough spare time Mm -hmm. it's like one one thing i've noticed that um because i often talk about like it's not a job but it's more like a hobby which means that i started to realize that you know what would who would i be if my work was taken away wow like who like what would be left Mm -hmm. and you know there's like two realizations at least like this is kind of ongoing process like it's it's really work (laughs) in progress progress, yeah. yeah So one thing is to kind of realize that, you know, I have um, friends and family, like really loved loved ones like yourself, part of my life. So like I would always have those people around me, like no matter what, mm-hmm. right? So that's, that's something kind of, you know, really beautiful. But then the scary part, which is kind of, you know, like discovering who, who am I outside ah, the yeah. performance? Mm-hmm. Um, because... Yeah, um, so like, I think that's like I'm I'm afraid of the kind of journey, but I'm also excited about it. Wow, kind of learning to kind of let go. That you know, it's. I mean, I love my work, mm-hmm. but I mean, I also love other aspects wow. of my life. So I kind of learning to let go and like. Um, nowadays, there's only a couple of moments when I feel that you know I'm pushing for twelve hours work like 12 hour work days or there was one deadline i had to meet so that was a bit of a um tough like mm-hmm. i had to work a lot but luckily i lost my hair already so i, I don't I, i don't have anything <laughs> to worry about you know it's like ga- game over for me um <laughs> but like otherwise because I, i remember when i was doing my phd like we used to actually boast who who works most oh really that was like so wow. toxic that's it just happened like you know and And for a long time, I used to have this attitude. Um, but of course, I mean, then and then it becomes like, you know, when you, when you are in the flow, but e- that, you know, then you end up investing more, mm-hmm. kind of spending more time at work. But even so, I think it's really like, just don't do it. Yeah. Like, that's what I say. Like, that's what I try to kind of, you know, like I've, I've noticed that there's so much that, you know, we need to voice, like actively. Mm-hmm. So like I'm telling my students nowadays, for example, that, I try, like, I, I'm not going to email you in the weekend. Don't do the same. Um, don't treat me as kind of Netflix. Like, I'm not like a teacher on demand, which I'm now contradicting our Nordic Rebels episodes. Yeah. But, like, I'm telling them, that, you know, hey, you know, I try to respect your life and your headspace. So please do the same for wow. me. Wow, wow, yeah. And, like, just making all these things uh, explicit It's just like, you know, we have like a, a from an educator, educator's point of view, we, you, we have such an opportunity and responsibility to voice these things. Mm-hmm. Like how do we, how do we kind of ensure that we can 
inspire and, and discover collectively this kind of healthier habits. Well, Mika, I mean, like this is uh, what, that's what I mean. I think that's so my deepest admiration because like, I'm, it gives me so much hope that uh, I know there's people like you out there who really are so conscious and aware of their responsibility and also give students and, and young minds the space and allow them to think and feel about these questions. Mm. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. And also, to just go back and don't leave this without notice, I really salute you that you actually um, kind of like, yeah, have the courage to embrace this question. Wait, who, who am I actually if I take this away? Because mm. like this is always like, it's very, wow, it's a powerful question, Mika, really. Like yeah. if you, because we have the image of ourselves, we have, you know, I'm Gerhard. And, and if you attach yourself too much on my career or like my podcast or what I try or I wear, it's a dangerous play. Because suddenly, mm. what what is what if this is gone? Yeah. Who are you then? Oh, that, that's really tough. But I think, like you know, like what you mentioned about your experience with mm -hmm. like the hive. Yeah. For example, when you, when you have that kind of when you move from transactions to relationships, mm -hmm. you know, people really kind of that's when you feel that, that's when you get that's when you become safe or confident. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can actually, I can try out these things. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, oh, there's one thing I think one I got this. You introduced me today, so like you you said you met you tried this, but I really love uh, this um, CV of failures. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah. you tell about this and why you thought it's important? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Tina Selig from Stanford University. She was the one who came up with the, mm -hmm. with the concept, and she asks or used to. I don't know if she does it again or still. She used to ask people in the classroom, students to, to write their CV, failure CV. Wow. And uh, kind of going past um, performance. Mm -hmm. Like especially in a business school, people have this, um, well, it's not a people issue, it's more like a structural issue. Absolutely. Yeah. So like, you know, you have to get the, the top grades. Mm -hmm. And maybe this happens in many other disciplines, but that's what I can only talk about mm -hmm. and design to some extent as well. But like, so what we do is like, we're going to ask people to share three failures and they can be any combination of private, academic, professional. And people have to visualize that. Like mm -hmm. some visualize, draw. Like, mm. So you kind of externalize your failure through the act of drawing. Wow. So it's a really kind of embodied experience that, you know, you let go of that failure. Wow. And then you explain to others, like, what was the failure and what did you learn from that? Mm -hmm. And this, we usually do this, like, really early on in the course. And people seem to enjoy that. Like, it's, it's a really emotional moment. Mm. And, and we also, like, we share our own failures as instructors as well. Yeah. So we share some of those to kind of help so you know we we all participate in again. creating a, lear a learning environment and like again also like um destroying these hierarchy structures like from teacher to top to uh, kind of at least eye to eye yeah in, by yeah. doing this as well yeah i think eye to eye that's a that's a really crucial point because i mean often the students are the ones who pay to mm -hmm. be there and you know we as instructors we are being paid mm -hmm. so we can't really get rid of that at least as, as Absolutely, it is now yeah. but i mean like what, yeah, what we try to do is like kind of interrogate and expose those hierarchy structures yeah. so that we can actually use them in a more meaningful way. And to just also like acknowledge that we are aware of it, but we don't have to yeah. kind of like stick to it. Yeah. 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 Wow. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, please, you know, like, uh, yeah, like no need to you, like no, no third person <laughs> approaches. <laughs> no, third person approaches. <laughs> no. Oh, no. This, oh, this reminds me. <laughs> It was also such a painful experience. So my father, now retired, but he also used to be a um, professor at university for <laughs> constructive engineering. And I remember it was, he was already retired, but then he got invited to a university in Graz, the town yeah. in South of Austria, <laughs> to kind of like, like a celebration of another professor who was leaving. And he asked me to, <laughs> to go, go with him. Oh, wow, it was such a painful experience because you would sit in this room all just <laughs> full of white old men. I mean, nothing about white old men, but it's just like this. It was characteristic for you know 
speaking of diversity, in this field and how they would speak, it was all about like performing. Mm. There's like there's all these old professors about it was such an ego play constantly. So there was a, a <laughs> it was a celebration actually, but then someone would give a was a, a beautiful lecture about a bridge. And then like I've never experienced this before. I was not used to this. Like this ego play of like challenging each other and like this who knows more and like also like third third person introduction. It was like I told my dad like we, we need to leave earlier. I c I can't deal this. <laughs> and he's like, Yeah, we have to go. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> oh man. But just to clarify, yeah. was it constructive engineering? Constructive engineering, yeah. Constructive. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, I st- sorry, I started kind of also thinking about, like, you know, emancipatory engineering or <laughs> kind, of kind of toxic engineering. Toxic. Or like <laughs> Playful engineering. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Constructive engineering. Yeah. But exactly, that's the kind of... Whew. It gives you shivers. Yeah. 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 And uh, I'm sure all of them would have appreciated to kind of like, hey, let go of your mask right now. Just, mm. how are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, like, I mean... I mean, this is actually quite interesting that, you know, like, yeah, letting go of masks or does the mask control you or do you control the mask? Because in a way, I mean, but that's another kind of dif- yeah. uh, philosophical discussion. But like I was re- recently reading and I, I don't, I don't want to kind of, this is going to <laughs> like, this is a digression, right? But uh, Catherine uh, Malabu, mm-hmm. she talks about like plasticity and she talks about mm-hmm. masks mm-hmm. and like, you know, like, for her, it's like kind of like the diversity of masks. Yes. But like not in a kind of, I guess like Goffman talks about masks as a sort of performance, mm-hmm. right? So like that's the kind of like wrong wrong kind of masks, if you will. Yeah. And I think there's also, I think I mentioned this also at one point, I think for me, masks almost relates to ego. And I think it's, uh, I think actually I disagree with the notion that you kind of like have to kill your ego or leave your ego behind because I think it's very good that we have masks as long as we are aware of it and mm. we can utilize them, but also remove them again. Yeah. I yeah. think it becomes, I wouldn't say dangerous, but like unhealthy if you stick to a mask and it almost kind of like you think that's you mm. and you just like identify yourself so much with this mask that yeah. almost like the, what's called the phantom. Ah, uh, phantom yeah. of the opera. Phantom of the opera. Yeah. yeah. Where this is you, but actually you actually you can always say, Okay, in this situation, I will put on this mask because it might it helps in this group situation, mm. but it also mm. helps to perform better, you know. That's so true. for this situation. Yeah. 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 yeah, it reminds me of like you know when I was. This happened maybe like twenty years ago, and like every now and then I would see when I when I w- I had these weird moments like when I was looking at myself in the mirror, <laughs> I would. Like I knew it was me, mm-hmm. but I had this really kind of weird disconnect yeah, yeah. that mm-hmm. you know it was me, but it wasn't me. And I think when I started like really facing my kind of blind sides or the ugly sides, then I started like I haven't had that experience in many many years. But who knows? Maybe it, maybe it's gonna come again. Hopefully not. But it's just like you know, like all these things like they kind of play into also like what happens in the classroom. Mm-hmm. So like you know like like for me like I don't really make the distinction so maybe that's like one of the reasons why I find it so kind of scary to kind of think like what if what if work is taken away wow. from me yeah but again it's all in my head right yeah, yeah of course and I think it's a very it's so powerful so Mika I really mm-hmm. encourage you to continue this journey because it's you will it might be scary at some points maybe painful but mm-hmm. very revealing yeah. actually funny that you mentioned the mirror thing I had a Similar situation two years ago, three years ago. I would look in the mirror and I was like, it was scary to look in the mirror. It's almost like wow. ali- alienating. You look at this like, but the longer you look, it's like, <laughs> there was something. You wouldn't, couldn't really identify yourself. Yeah. yeah. And um, there's actually one thing you can uh, I can recommend you. It's called the Obsidian Mirror. It's also from Peru. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful. It's made of Obsidian. Not from Peru, <laughs> from Latin America. <laughs> okay, but it's okay. made of obsidian. It's like this dark mirror. And it's uh, I tried it for the first time in Peru. It's a very interesting experience to look into the obsidian mirror. Because it's kind of like it, it, what, it, what it tries to do is kind of like to uh, remove the shadow layers and to see your true self again. Wow. First, it's scary because you see 
still like it's a bit weird but then like wow yeah that's so interesting so obsidian mirror obsidian mirror yeah okay <laughs> just writing it down <laughs> closing <please>. closing check <laughs> 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 but i think it's a beautiful like going back because like it's so amazing that you kind of like create this space or you try to create a space in a classroom where students to some extent can f almost feel at ease with themselves and really understand what is find this yeah goosebumpy feeling in the learning journey hmm. that's remarkable because i think remember when i looked into you partially did my phd i read one one thing in what great education makes really great is great teachers like you <laughs> because in the end nika students will look back and they will always remember this one teacher hmm. Yeah. Ken Hart, wow. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. Like, Thank you so much for saying that. Mm. It, it really means a lot to me. Like, yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, it's it's remarkable. And now that um, it's already one hour, six minutes, Nika. Wow. Do you want to press a button? Um, can I? Yes, of course. Oh, I forgot to be... Ah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so... With Nordic Rebels, you have, you and your team have created something that already makes education a bit better than you have found it. It's kind of like, and you continue doing it. Mm. So now you're like, not even half of your time spent, hopefully. What do you have in mind to try or like, do you have anything you would like to try in the next decades? next decades like i've always and this is more like again like from a work um like i would love to try driving a taxi okay but but i mean again like this is like kind of performance yeah right i think like what i've like for the next decades i would like to be more present in in my friends and family's lives like mm. you, know, you know be actively uh, like act more actively con kind of care how they are doing and like you know what can I do for them yeah um, like yeah I don't know just being um, I think like you know when I'm I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about this now like I haven't to be honest I haven't thought about this mm -hmm. you know it's always been like what do I want to achieve in work and I don't think they are going to go away mm -hmm like all those kind of work related dreams but i think like what i what i'm what i'm really excited about next is kind of discovering what do i feel excited about mm -hmm. like really kind of you know like discovering new things mm -hmm. outside work mm -hmm. kind of discovering all those things i mean i i do have like some passion projects or not projects but like things i really enjoy outside work but maybe i i would say like this is really like kind of taking the time for myself and for those around me yeah wow yeah. it's beautiful and i think it's also the, the yeah finding things that excite you yeah. as should be you know many things in our life all the time <laughs> why shouldn't <laughs> they be <laughs> yeah yeah i agree okay mika we're coming to an end um thank you so so much for this yeah beautiful episode thank you for having me Thank you so much for this. <laughs> Thank you for the cacao. Cacao. And uh, if you want, you can have another licorice after the show. After the show. <laughs> <laughs> I want it now. I want it now. <laughs> and um, yeah, any final words you would like to maybe share about Nordic Rebels, if people are interested or anything? A joke? Um, a joke. Oh, not a joke. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad jokes are really awful and limited and they are <laughs> stolen from other people. So... <coughs> I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm on. Yeah, I'm not gonna go go into that. But okay. Um, link in bio nordicrebels.com. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I would love to hear like. You know, from others. Like, I would love to learn from other people. So, if there's something that you know, who who uh, amongst the listeners or the viewers, um, if there's something that you think we as Nordic Rebels we should learn or gonna mm. be exposed to i would love to see that all right yeah amazing okay beautiful beautiful thank you mika thank you Gerhard. thank you <laughs>
Amazing. 